Hey guys. Uh, so Adrian, David, and uh, James, and uh, Neiman, are you guys all presenting? Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna yeah, okay. add you guys as a co-host so you can share. You got very long hair, Shane. Trying to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I see you, we can compare. Yeah. Well, like, is it like 2013 or something? 30 or uh, that five, 10 years time. <laughs> if you wait for the next crypto conference to cut your hair, you might wait a long time. Yeah. Hopefully, like, Colombia. Columbia, yeah, that happens. I hope stuff can happen before that. But like, yeah, I'm still hoping for Berlin Week 2021. 2021, yeah. I think Tokyo just said we'll definitely do Tokyo Olympic next year, but like, to to declare that we combated like COVID and that we we didn't really combat anything yet. So in I mean Paris is the next Olympics in 2024, and they are already cutting down some of the project because they think it will be smaller than they expected. Really? Okay. Uh, I'll just wait a few more minutes, and uh, so each of you got initially I just talk a few minutes, and uh, each of you guys so there's four four of us. Well, four of you guys, so like you each have a 10 minutes. So it's up to you whether you spend five minutes talk, five minutes for the Q&A feedback, or you spend majority of time to just chill. Up to you, but after 10 minutes, I just say like, you know, cut, okay? And let me share. Mm -hmm. And the probe, I'll, I'll let you know like you one minute before, you know, 10 minutes is end. And uh, okay, I'm not sharing, uh, presenting. Okay, so yeah, this is the last session. So what we want to do is uh, I'll do a quick show about the workshop I just decided to do. Then we'll do the sh uh, full show and tell. Uh, probably we'll go with this order, uh, first ENS login, second DeFi set, triple seven, third Almonet, and fourth GeoENS. And uh, so this is the last session, so I'm thinking about doing it for one hour. Uh, then like in the end, we just want to have a kind of open discussion about like, you know, what kind of tooling X system will be needed or I think, and also at the same time, how do we encourage more participation? Because lack of participation, as we discussed in the governance, is is kind of a bit of an issue. So if you guys have any good ideas, just throw it, okay? And so, yeah, my thing is like, uh, I think uh, Brownlee is gonna do uh, ENS workshop at the ESON online after this event, I think. But did that uh, yesterday. It was yesterday. Oh, it, okay, you already did. Okay, sorry. It, it's on YouTube. It's recorded. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll try to do more technical one of like you know going through different tool set or and also like a because in the ENS app kind of uses pretty much every feature of the uh, what you can do with ENS. I I can talk through and also we are working on the ENS JS V two. If that's ready by next week, uh, we'll probably we'll talk about it. And also, 
that's a kind of first few days after the is global online hackathon starts. So if you have some like project and if you want to ask some question about how you do integration or how you can make more use of ENS, I'm more than happy to do. And uh, because it's kind of such open office, I put on a, uh, a task that called kickback uh, where you just stake and if you don't come, you basically lose the money. And it runs on XDAI. So like if you are intrigued by the XDAI talk in the first session, a great time to ask VP. And if you are already pro, please help sharing this workshop because if it's less than five people, probably I can't be bothered doing it. So I'll just cancel. But I'll do it in the two timelines uh, on the like morning UK time, which is gonna fit like uh, Asia and the Europe and the evening time, which is gonna fit Europe and the uh, US. So that's it. And uh, I'll stop share. So, uh, Adrian, do you want to go first? I think I put as a co host, so you should be able to share. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I was looking on how to unmute me. Uh, okay, so you might be familiar with the concept of Web3 model. Uh, basically, it's a way for you to choose which wallet you want to connect to, to a website. And this is something that has been along for a long time, but we think there is issues with that. One of the things is that each of those providers uh, is somehow whitelisted or is part of the package. So if I create a new uh, login mechanism tomorrow, I'm not going to be part of Web3 model, so I cannot be used on many websites. And also this means that as a user, I have to remember if I'm using MetaMask, Wallet Connect, or Osirium, uh, which poor user can do, but most people in the long run, I expect will just know their account name. And since account names are hard to remember in Ethereum, they will just remember their ENS name. So this was the concept behind uh, ENS login. And the idea behind ENS login is just that you put your username as an ENS username, and it will detect that, hey, this, user, this account is a MetaMask. Or maybe you are not seeing that, but I'm getting the MetaMask notification right now. And so I can just click on connect. And if I try to sign personal data, then I'm getting a MetaMask notification that you may or may not see right now, but I'm able to sign a message. In the same way, I can go back here and say, this time I want to, to log in with my Portis uh, wallet. And again, I just put an ENS name, but it automatically detects that this is a, a Portis wallet. And I'm getting the Portis model that you may or may not see right now. And I'm getting connected to my Portis account and I can sign, sign data using Portis. So how this, do, does this work? Basically, if you go to the app in this domain, you can see that I've got this text, text, text record set up that is basically a link to a JavaScript file that contains uh, the SDK of whatever I'm using. Here I'm using HTTPS because it's much faster, but technically I could also do that uh, using IPFS. So there are mechanisms for me to just log in using data that comes from IPFS, which is more decentralized and more secure, but also a bit slower. If this is IPFS, it's a bit slower. Uh, so there are mechanisms for this to work with resolution of the NS name on one blockchain and connecting to another blockchain. So uh, hypothetically, we could use that with resolution of the of the data of the ENS data on a layer two, while still connecting to mainnet or Gory or everything. Uh, also, what's interesting is that there are mechanisms so that each user doesn't have to register their own account. Uh, for example, if you are using uh, like Hadrian.Argent.xyz, Argent.xyz could just set up the module for Wallet Connect. And so you would be able to connect with Argent with a single uh, uh, a, a single setup in ENS, not one per user. So this is the idea. And in the long run, the idea is that it's entirely open, entirely decentralized, meaning that any website that uses this SDK, this login with ENS, login with Ethereum, is 
uh, instantly compatible with all wallets, uh, even those that are not that do not already exist. Uh, and if you are a wallet provider, if you are like building Firefly, you could bring a module for Firefly, uh, record it in the ENS, and any website out there, including let's say OpenSea or app.ems domain that uses this SDK, would be instantly compatible with your Firefly or your wallet because you just build a module to do so. And this cut, this eliminates all like censorship mechanism or selection mechanism that you have with mechanism like Web3 model where there is a limited number of wallets. So I think this was like something like five, six minutes. So if you have any questions. There's a couple question in the chat channel. Uh, no? Or is it more comment? Yeah, so I mean, uh, what, what, I mean, thanks Rick Mo, and I would love to see the Firefly work on that. One of the main issue with uh, with this concept right now, with this idea is that basically what, there are two things we want to, to standardize. Uh, and basically it's the communication between uh, the SDK and the modules. And then the modules will basically provide a JavaScript object that has to be compatible. And I know there is an ERC for that, but some of the like injected Web3 objects from many providers behave in a different way, different pattern. So there is a lot of testing to make sure that they are all compatible. Yeah, and uh, I, I think this is really great. I mean, we've like, we really like this. And um, Hadrian, you know, as you, we've talked, we've talked about in Makoto and this, we've talked about. So Unilogin just closed down um, and they were going to maybe be a su early supporter of this. I mean, you know what I mean? Uh, I think other uh, supporters were going to be Authorium, which is still going. And Argent, which is no longer giving people subdomains due to gas costs. And just gas costs around setting this up. I mean, this is sort of like a problem. So, Hadrian, just what are your thoughts about that? I mean, is this like just the wrong time? Is this maybe no, something I, for the future? I, I, or think it's, I, I think it's it's still the right. I mean, the demo I, I showed you, uh, basically in the SDK, is there is a mechanism to uh, to sh cut down between uh, having the resolution of the ENS domain being done on one on one network because basically what you need to do is get an IPFS or an HTTPS handle uh, from from a decentralized source, but but you could do that on Gorli or on mainnet, and then you instantiate the object to ask it to connect to a certain blockchain. And right now, for gas purposes, even when I want to connect with uh, to mainnet. I'm, you do it using a resolution on Gorli because the setup on Gorli was less expensive. And depending on how ENS on layer to evolve, this could be a great use case where the resolution that is done to find the module can be done on layer two, so in a very cheap way. And once we get the data through layer two, as Vitalik discussed uh, in the first session, then we can instantiate a wallet and use it to connect to basically any network that might be XDAI, uh, mainnet, uh, potentially another layer two. So obviously like the very initial design uh, was not clearly compatible with, uh, with the current gas cost, but this can very simply be tweaked to made compatible with any scaling solution. I guess that doesn't completely destroy the nature of ENS. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions or comment? So I guess I'm just thinking like, is it worth, well, maybe, uh, well, anyway, actually, I think uh, I will stop it there. We can move on to the next person. Yeah. yeah if you want to discuss about this, uh, just contact me on Twitter and, or, or anywhere else. I mean, the discussion can go on after, after this session. I mean, and I have to say also, it's not my project, it's a common project. Many people from the community work on that. I see people from Materium and Portis on, on the call. Also Makoto helped a lot. So, so And the original idea comes from Alessandro on the sun. So I'd like to, to shout out to everybody that helped building that. Cool, thank you, uh, Adrian. And uh, uh, I'll just show my face. Uh, next up, I think it was David. 
you suggest that you want to go for the show the the D5 777. Uh, Do you want to present? Sure. Yeah. Let's see. You see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Hey, yeah, so I am David Myhall, and yeah, I'm just gonna do a really quick run through of one of the projects I'm working on, which is DeFi 777. Um, it's kind of the background of this. I started this during Hack Money back in the spring. Um, let's see what's on the next slide. Well, so, so what DeFi 777 is, is um, I guess kind of my goal is, that my magic moment getting into Ethereum was like back in 2017 when I was trying to do some ICO and I like, you know, the, the UX of ICOs was typically you just send some ETH to an address and you get some tokens back. And yeah, that was kind of a magic moment to me, this idea that like I was used to Bitcoin, like send some tokens to a funny looking address. But the idea of being able to send tokens to an address and it run some code was was a really exciting thing. Um, and we don't really like have that user experience with ERC20 tokens. And basically it, DeFi and and pretty much all parts of Ethereum require using a DAP browser. So what I'm doing with DeFi 777 is we're using ERC 777 tokens, which uh, if you're not familiar with those, it's like a, a super set of ERC 20. It's like ERC 20s with some fun features. Um, making all these wrapper, you know, a, a wrapper factory where you can wrap any ERC 20 and, and a bunch of adapters so you can send them to, um, to contracts or to these ENS names, and it'll execute an action like, you know, um, swapping on Uniswap or depositing an Aave or something. Um, here's kind of an example of, of this architecture. We've got kind of these wrapper tokens, which have a token on the inside. Um, and so what the user would do is they would send it to an address like here we have wbtc.uniswap777.eth. Um, and that's the address of like a, a adapter contract. That adapter will unwrap this token, do some swapping and send you back a wrapped token. Um, and so the cool thing about this is, you know, I, I hope that this can open up DeFi and, and some of these really exciting things on Ethereum to more users, maybe users who aren't comfortable with MetaMask and like can set in their gas price and gas limit and stuff. Um, you can see here, I've got an example of kind of how this would look in the Coinbase wallet, which, um, you know, kind of a, a basic non dap browser -y wallet. Um, we've just got all these like wrapper tokens here. We've got DAI and ADAI and a, a set token and, and maker. Um, what the user would do is they would send it to an ENS address. Here's um, some of the, the ones that are currently set up so they can, you know, s swap through Uniswap, they can, open a, get a set token or deposit in Aave. Um, yeah, and that, that's just kind of what it would look like, send to that address and get something back. So that's kind of the high level overview, but I, I thought this was relevant because I think this is one of the only projects I know of that's trying to use like ENS as a, a UI. Um, you know, the user doesn't have a, a visual UI, they just type in kind of a, an ENS name representing what they want to do. It, it almost kind of reminds me of like, a command line interface, you know, that you type in the command you want to execute and just hit enter instead of clicking through a, a user interface. Um, here, there's some examples. These, these names on the left are some names that are um, already being used for the contracts that are there. And uh, yeah, and so I'm, I'm kind of moving forward. I'm experimenting with some, you know, a lot of new ways that this project can open up new things and do more complicated things. Um, these names on the right are like, I'm experimenting with different ways that we could use MakerDAO on, you know, like opening a vault or something like that. So I guess the idea is you could send some ETH to like new vault maker and get a vault name or something. Um, so yeah, just kind of experiment with that. The other thing I'm kind of experimenting with, this is maybe a little ways off, but the idea of, um, because you know if you're using something like you know just a coinbase wallet to send to an ens address you don't you know we can't do much like client side computation um in terms of like selecting um in this case like selecting a pool that has a good price so one thing i've been kind of looking into is um can we do things with like a custom resolver where we have a resolver that like 
you know, you, you say, I want to get some WBTC and this resolver is going to like check a bunch of different balancer pools, find the one with the best price and return that address to you. So um, yeah, those are just some kind of interesting ideas around this that I wanted to share. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if you think this was interesting, feel free to throw me a die or two on Gitcoin. And uh, that's pretty much it. So I haven't got any questions. Can you... Can you expand a bit on what 777 specifically enables in this pattern? Sure. So uh, the main thing, uh, 777 does, uh, it adds a number of new features, but the main one that uh, we're taking advantage of is like, these hooks, like sending and receiving hooks, which is basically the same thing as like the, the fallback function or the receive function um, for a normal smart contract. Um, so this is, you know, with that fallback function, if you send ETH to a contract, the, the contract can run some code when it receives ETH. Uh, with 777, a contract can define this like token received function. And when a, a 777 token is sent to it, it'll execute that code. So, you know, for example, when, when you send some DAI 777 to um, a, uh, one of these adapter contracts, it, you know, that hook gets called and then in that hook, it's going to like do the swap and it's going to send you back a, a different token. So that's the, the main thing we're using with 777. Uh, just one comment slash question. I think we had one project which did something similar that using ENS name as a way to instantly uh, exchange. It's not as extensive as yours because yours can't do anything. And they ask us to put into the ENS website. One reason we are a bit worried is that the ENS name, if you you actually have to put a lot of trust on that under mm -hmm. that ENS name because they could do rug pull. And I wonder, do you have any ways to verify or like do you like you know or freeze that like once it's set like you can't do anything. Um, I mean, you could definitely have, um, you know, the name owned by like a, a time locked contract so that the, at least you could say like, you know, the owner of the, the name can't change the contract without like a few days notice. But I mean, generally, I guess I would say like, what's the difference between that and like just a, a DAP that rug pulls? Like I could, I could make a, a Uniswap fork UI and then I, people start using it. And then while they're using it, I could swap out the address with my, you know, malicious contract to steal funds. So um, it's, it's a legitimate concern, but I think that's concern that applies to kind of just all sorts of, uh, you know, untrusted or, or new projects. Yeah, I'd also say, I think this is very like unblockchain-ish, but one um, help against this is if the people running it are known people, right? I mean, not that doesn't like prevent them from doing it, but it like makes it less likely because there's like social fallout, we know who they are or something like this, mm -hmm. assuming that they really are the people running it. I think in the case of the other one, no offense to this other person, I'm sure you're a nice person. It was now .eth is the name he had and he was doing subdomains. We just didn't really know who he was. It was like, do we trust this person or not? I have no idea. Um, but you're right. I think the social protection, I think is something. Uh, it would be nice if there were other protections also like technical protections in place as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that that's a good point that we, we didn't know who they were, but if you can encourage Uniswaps to add that as an extra, you know, Uniswap already have their uh, normal website. They already have the IPFS version using ENS. So if you could encourage Uniswaps to issue these subdomain under Uniswap.es, probably that could get away with the trust issue. Yeah, and that should be really cool now that like, you know, Uniswap has uh, their, their token and stuff. Um, like obviously right now I own all these domains, but it'd be cool to like pass off ownership to like Uniswap governance or something so they could choose. Um, Cause obviously there is like a kind of some manual selection of like which name gets associated with which address. So yeah, that'd be, a, that's a good idea. Any other question, comment? Okay, thank you, David. Thanks guys. And I can't remember who was the third speaker. Let me check my slide. I'm on it. All right, so that's me. Yeah, okay, go for okay. it. Good, hi everybody. Um, I'm Eyal, Neyman is a nickname. 
and I'm from Armonit. Like everyone in this session, we don't develop ENS, but we really use ENS. And I think that basically what we do is we try to create like alternative web built around ENS. So we, we call it decentralized websites. It's stuff that connect ENS and some decentralized storage like IPFS or Swarm. We also have something that we did with Skynet, which is decentralized storage based on SIA and stuff like that. Um, what we do is not creating websites. I mean, we also create websites, but uh, what we do is really like kind of build of infrastructure of, of products and services and all kinds of tools with people who wants to use this uh, new decentralized webs built around DNS could use it, uh, or people who wants to build it would have stuff that they can do to build it. Now, we have three projects like this so far, but actually no. Let me do it in order and first tell you about the project itself, you know, Almonit, and then I say about like the, the, the products that we have so far. So Almonit began like a year and a half ago as a side project of uh, a few friends. And now a year and a half later, it's still a hobby project in the sense that we do it in our free time and we don't get paid for it, but we hope it's like the, gonna change soon. So we are trying now to, to secure some funds or grants or something to develop it properly. Um, the first thing that we did, she maybe for this I can share my screen. Let's see. Oh, damn it. I have like a super strange operation system and sharing my screen is not so easy. Okay, I hope it would work out. Yeah, it's fine. So the first thing that we did is just a browser extension. Uh, well, we started with that. I mean, nowadays you have uh, eth.link, you have unstable domains extension, MetaMask is doing all right with their extension. Uh, when we started, like MetaMask was the only one who, who you could use to do that and they were not doing so great at the time. So we just released our own extension. This is the installation page. As you see, it's a bit silly. Uh, silliness is my part of the project. The, the rest of the guys are a bit more serious. And once you install it, you can choose if you want to see the website or know more about the website. The website is how we call decentralized websites because if you give a talk and you say decentralized websites 20 times, you basically break your tongue. Um, the extension is supposed to be like super decentralized like like it, it's supposed to be easy for 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 regular users like if you're just a regular users and you want to use it then then you can go and install and, and, and you don't have to think about anything but if you're a power users you can um, uh, um, you know do your local stuff you can basically every time that we every session it chooses a random ipfs gateway for decentralization but you can also first a gateway you can have your own ipfs node if you're a developer you can actually use testnet this is right now uh, the version that we are going to release next week. So the testnet support will be next week, but you can use a uh, testnet if you're a developer and then you can go to, we have in Robston a website. I know that ENS uses dot test endings for the testnet, but dot test is actually like existing TLD. So we couldn't use it in the extension. So we have to do TETH. And then if everything works, because it's, of course it doesn't work. So I probably chose the wrong uh, testnet. Um, the main thing that we, so this began as like a really side fun project. And then when we did it, we were actually wondering like how many, how many, um, decentralized website, website already exist. So something seems to be wrong with my internet, I guess. No, no, not with my internet, with me typing while, while talking. So we were wondering how many websites actually exist. And then we did, um, I mean, a short research, you know, going calling for Ethereum blo uh, blockchain and ENS contract. And we found like we made a list of all the websites. We put it in the ENS forum and then Bradley suggested that we would make a kind of a Yahoo style directory for all the websites because they were like about 15 at a time, not, not, not like the directory would be fine. We did that uh, and we started to like regularly updating, updating it. Like we had some tools uh, to call ENS and, and, and Ethereum blockchain all the time, see what is being updated. Um, with the time, the amount of websites like kind of grew and this directly was not enough. So this is partially of what we have so far. And then uh, we had the idea, this was the beginning of this year, just before the Corona, we released this uh, decentralized search engine. So it's completely client side. Um, it works very well, I hope, let's see. Yeah, I mean, so 
it makes searches. If you just want to still scroll like a directory, a directory you also have a discover thing here. Um, we did it like in, I said, January and then February, we continued to improve some things and now we, we continually all the time maintain it. Like, like uh, we used to do twice a week to update the list of, of, of uh, decentralized websites. <laughs> we do it like once in a week or once or two weeks because it became really expensive. Uh, and we have to choose like special time of the days where the price is a bit more reasonable. So that's about gas price, which I think everyone who is doing that stuff with ENS or Ethereum suffer from. Um, and when Corona began, I think when Corona began was kind of a turning point for us because then we also decided that it's about time to take this, this hobby project and this hobby project grew into taking more and more of our time. And we decided to take it, I think that now I can stop sharing because the, the last product is, is not published yet. So now you can see my pretty face. We decided to take this, uh, this, this project and start to make it like something that we can actually, you know, make a living off and do it in full-time job. So th this is where the third project came in, into play because what we noticed with the search engine is that you don't have enough um, decentralized website. I mean, to really start working on, 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 on scaling the search engine and improving it. And we wanted to make a tool that people can kind of create more and more of their decentralized websites. And, and when I make a tool, not tool for developers, but more like, you know, Medium or WordPress or, or even Facebook that lets nowadays, you know, create businesses their own, their own uh, page. So we came up with the idea to make a self-governing platform for publications. So it's kind of a self-governing medium. Um, we have been developing it ever since. And right now the state where we are is that we have a proof of concept, which is working locally. In a week, I hope it will also be on testnet. So if anyone here uh, interested in, in testing it, they should contact us. I will say in the end how. The main idea there is that, so the main idea there is really the self-governing. We, 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 and, and, and then ENS is not a goal and decentralization is not a goal, but decentralization is a tool to have a self-governing of the system. We want to have this system to be a, so it will have an ENS name, but the ENS name will be the controlled by a DAO. And the DAO would be a bit, I think, like how Elon in the previous session described the DX DAO. It would be like a, a cooperative representing all people with interest in the system. So developers, possibly investors, users, authors, moderators, whoever wants, and hopefully slowly grows. Um, I think that's more or less about it. Uh, we also have a Gitcoin, uh, which we, we get some nice donations in the last week or two, which was super nice. We have a Telegram channel. Uh, you can find it all in our, in our uh, Twitter and basically in our blog. So blog.almonit.eth, there is, there is like stuff there. We also have, a, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Matrix and I was like dragging the whole group to use Matrix. So we have a Matrix group which is obviously a bit less crowded than the Telegram one, but I, 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 but if you are like Matrix fans like me, you are welcome to join, to join there. Again, go to our blog and, and you will see how. And I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say, I love Almanit and it's, it's maybe the project that re, re, related to ENS I promote the most insofar as almost in every presentation, I recommend people go to almanit.eth or almanit.eth.link to see you know, the growth of decentralized web. I think it's great. Yeah, we, we noticed that and we really appreciate it, I have to say, so it's, it's great, yeah. How much are you spending on the gas cost for to be indexed every week? I mean, it depends. So, so now, now, now I try to do it in hours when some dollar and a half. Uh, I, I think there, there were like at least one time, I think it was like $5. So it's not so much, but, but um, we already pay for like several costs. And, and it said it's all right, uh, right now of our own dime. So we're trying to minimize costs. We, would, we, we, we really, you know, we came to the layer two session uh, because for us it will be, I mean, for Armonit right now, it's not so, so bad, but if you want to have a, a really self-governing publication system, then, then those prices to publish and edit and correct a typo, correct a typo in, in an article, it's, it's a bit of a bump, of, 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 it's a problem. But I realize also that it's, layer two is not going to come in the next few months. So, you know, that's what we got. And with this, we, we have to, to make work. Yeah, 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, last not least, uh, James. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? Great. Um, cool. So, uh, so my name is James Chancholis. I'm a, a PhD student at Georgia Tech uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S. I should add. Um, and uh, I, I've got this idea uh, that I'm looking for feedback on. It's called Geo ENS. Uh, it's not really a DAP that's built on top of ENS or that uses ENS, but it adds a feature to ENS. And uh, there's a lot of people in the room who, a lot, who know a lot more about DNS than I do. So um, I bet you guys have an idea about where I'm going with this. Um, but for those who don't, um, let me paint a picture for you. So stay, say that you're hosting static web content in IPFS, you're using ENS, and um, you've gotten really popular now. And now you want to translate your website into two different languages and uh, or multiple languages and you want your users to get pointed to the right IPFS content hash based on their geography. So as far as I know, uh, you cannot solve this problem with ENS. Um, the internet's a big place, so I could be wrong, but uh, <laughs> from what I've looked up, uh, this seems to be true. Um, now, how do people solve this problem in DNS? Um, well, uh, it's called GeoDNS, or more technically, Geographic Split Horizon, and it allows you to do just this. So you get different DNS sets of resource records based on the IP address where the client is coming from. Either it's the IP address of the recursive resolver or the IP address of the client subnet that gets passed through the resolver. Um, that's ECS. Um, but uh, they've worked out this problem. Um, now, let's say hypothetically, we brought this power to ENS, called it GeoENS. Well, what could you do? Um, let's say you're storing DNS resource records in ENS, as uh, Jim McDonald would have you do. Uh, you can do everything that GeoENS Geo does then. You can do proximity-based load balancing. You can direct your users to different servers. Um, now, let's say you're storing IPFS content hashes in e ENS. Um, this is my first example. You can now translate your web page based on where your users are coming from. And then lastly, uh, which is probably the most interesting to ENS because it's specific to Ethereum, but if you're storing Ethereum addresses in ENS, you can now tie geography to Ethereum addresses. So uh, say for example, um, I have a brick and mortar store and I have multiple locations and each location of my brick and mortar store uh, has a different wallet associated with it. And I use Ethereum for my payment processing. Um, with GeoENS, now users can make a single domain name, an ENS name lookup, and get the specific wallet address of the store that they're standing next to. So this might be useful if, say, for example, the store is franchised or something. You know, the same people don't own the same brick and mortar store, but uh, they share the same name. Um, these are just some ideas that I'm trying to give you. Um, so uh, we did this, uh, I did this, um, and uh, I'm just going to really quickly kind of give you a flavor of how it works. This is a really short presentation, so I'm not going to dive into things. Um, but uh, at the highest level, uh, we use geohashes uh, to store, to associate locations with each resource record. A geohash is just interleaved bits of longitude and latitude, and the longer the geohash is, the more bits you have, the more precise you are. So um, uh, we store the resource records in the smart contract in this kind of esoteric data structure. It's called a quad tree. Um, it's a tri. And you can see at the root of this tri, we have uh, actual resource records with addresses. And then this is uh, geohash here, 324, and it's stored at the path 324. Now, the reason you would put an index like this in the blockchain as opposed to building it outside of the blockchain is because you can do really efficient range queries. Um, so if I want to query for all resource records that start with 3.2 right here, I traverse to this node in the, in the tree, and then I do a BFS or DFS and get the remaining records. So that would be these two. Um, 
So now let's talk about something that GeoENS, solving the problem in this way, gives you that, it, that GeoDNS doesn't give you. Um, so GeoDNS relies on these re really inaccurate databases that map IP addresses to geography, to locations. Um, and because these databases are so inaccurate, uh, an example of one is like MaxMind. Uh, they're called GeoIP databases. Um, uh, practically what that means is if you use a, a public GeoDNS service like Amazon's Route 53, you can only carve up your users at the granularity of a U.S. state. Uh, I don't know how it works outside the U.S., but I, the problem remains is that you can't get very precise because you have these inaccuracies in your, in your GeoIP databases. Uh, so with GeoENS, on the other hand, now a user is actually supplying their location when they make the call into the smart contract. And since they're supplying their own location, you're not relying on these inaccurate databases, and now you can, you can be in as accurate as you want to be. I mean, theoretically, you can describe a molecule on the surface of the Earth, um, but our reference implement implementation is uh, accurate to plus or minus 20 meters. So here on the right side of your screen, I just put a map just to get your imagination going. This is a map of Mykonos, and there are five records with different uh, locations added into the GeoENS smart contract under a single domain name. And then the colored squares are different query regions that you can make. Um, and so it's just to give you an idea of the scale that's possible. You can't do this with GeoDNS, or at least you can't do it accurately. Um, so, the real question becomes then, what is the cost? Uh, this is a layer one solution. You're, you're storing geo hashes in a smart contract. You're maintaining an ind index. Uh, what do you pay for it? Um, and the, the answer is you pay in gas. Um, so uh, we ran this experiment where we added a resource record to a single domain name for every cell tower in the US. So this is, a, this is what you're seeing on your screen right now. That's a picture of all the cell towers in the US. There's about 130,000 of, of them. And uh, we added all of them with their respective locations to a single domain name. Um, and here's what that costs. Uh, so on the left side of your screen, you'll see this is just normal mainnet transactions, has nothing to do with GeoENS. And then on the right side, this is the gas cost to add uh, all the cell towers. So it's a histogram. Um, and you can see here, the big takeaway is that uh, on average, we're sitting right around here, uh, 0.4 times 10 to the six uh, uh, way. Um, and as far as where that is on mainnet transactions, it's sitting right here. So it, it's expensive. Um, it's not cheap to do this and to main, maintain this index. But uh, the takeaway here is that it's not really prohibitively expensive. Um, at, at least, I guess that depends on your definition, um, but it is possible. Um, one thing I want to note here is that uh, the transaction costs have this bell-shaped curve. They have, it's not a constant gas cost because you're actually allocating, like depending on how uh, close geographically the two records you want to allocate are, uh, you're, uh, you're allocating less nodes in the quad tree, right? So you're amortizing the cost of maintaining the index over multiple ads. And so the closer that your two resource records are that you want to add, the less the tree you have to allocate, so the cheaper it is. Um, and that's why you get this distribution um, instead of a fixed gas cost. Um, and uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's all I got for you today. Uh, I tried to be brief and quick since I'm at the end here. Um, if you want to learn more about me, here's uh, my website. Uh, this work was proposed as EIP 2390. Um, and, uh, and I've also included a link here to a reference implementation, uh, which is actually just one of the polymorphic flavors of the resolver contract. Um, uh, so this is actually a link to a pull request to the ENS repo where this is all implemented. And there's some test cases where you can play with it and see, see how it works. Um, and the slide deck will be also on my website if you, if you want access to that. Um, so uh, anyone have any questions or feedback for me here? Looks like you have one in the um, chat. Yeah, from Nick. Oh, I see it now, yeah. 
Uh, it might be better to use existing open location codes for geo coordinates as they are standard and already supported by map providers. Um, so you're talking about just how to encode um, uh, the hash. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good point. Yeah, Hilbert geo hashes are problematic. Uh, there, uh, Google's got their own S2 or S3, I think they call it, uh, geo spatial indexing. Uh, but that's the magic. You can use anything, just so long as uh, a matching prefix of geohash or whatever matches, assuming the location is similar. Like the more similar the prefixes, the closer they are geographically. Any other comment questions? Yeah. Question. So, James, uh, really interesting presentation. We'll have to think more about this. Um, in, in previous uh, presentations I've given to different groups, some people have brought up this exact problem that you're talking about. Like, well, how does ENS deal with this, uh, particularly uh, given the way that you can be going from your local node or something like this, right? It's not like, oh, you have an IP address that's linked to a geographic location and the DNS servers can automatically do it, right? Um, Somebody, somebody had this idea, and just how does this compare to yours? If, if we could, maybe for a content record, just have like an extra bit of data that just, we can code this as this is for people in France. And then you can, I know somehow have your client, will just look up, always get me the thing that's coded for France or something like this. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, if it's just a bit, um, I'm not sure how precise that you can get, right? Like um, having an arbitrary number of bits of pre precision can be valuable if you're actually trying to um, uh, do something that requires that. Um, so I think this solution ends up being a little bit more flexible. Um, and it also, uh, I, I don't know if that suggestion requires that you're doing this with IPFS, like your IPFS content hash actually encodes uh, part of the location. Is that, is that true? Well, yeah, I mean, I was thinking like, rather than just having one, I, c I could have as many as I want with an added bit of data of like, this is for people with this, like of this language and there's some standard thing. So, so like what I'm talking about would be far less granular than what you're talking about. You're talking about things that could be extremely granular. Um, I I'm just thinking this is a problem people brought up. You're right to be working on this. I'm just thinking this is a kind of another thing that's been talked about. I guess I'm just thinking out loud and seeing what you think about it. Yeah, uh, well, it depends where that bit is, right? If that bit is in the IPFS content hash, if you build it into the, uh, I, I think IPFS uses Kademlia DHT. Like if you build that into the DHT, then uh, okay, that's fine, you can do that. But uh, that requires you changing the DHT that IPFS uses. Like this is, uh, it's a smart contract, It's um, I, th I think it would, it actually did have, I did have to modify the uh, top level resolver contract just to add GOENS as another like, you know, polymorphic child class or whatever. Um, but uh, as far as changing how IPFS resolves content, like this is a very minimal change to that. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit easier uh, it, to get momentum from an engineering perspective. Um, and yeah, yeah, then you also get the, the granularity. Uh, in the comment section, James said Web3 login plus lang text because equal fetch lang website. I, does that make sense or should James elaborate or? Well, I guess you're not necessarily always logged in when you're fetching a Web3 website though, right? You don't have to be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is inherent in ENS. Um, it's interesting. It's, web, it's interesting idea what you're saying, but yeah, you're not always necessarily logged in. James, you just want to talk? Yeah. Or if you prefer, or the other yeah. James, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. James Montgomery. I'm sorry. <laughs> two, two James. Sorry. Yeah. I don't talk anymore. 
Well, I, yeah, okay. Do you have anything else to say about it, or maybe that was I, all no, 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 nothing else to say. Uh, that's all I got. Uh, if you want to learn more, again, there's an EIP for it, uh, 2390. That's got a link to a discussion section. If you think of something after the fact, uh, I'd be really interested in hearing it. Um, I'm not really, uh, uh, I guess, ingrained in a lot of the blockchain community and stuff. I'm kind of an outsider. So I wanted to thank you guys for inviting me and letting me uh, get a chance to pitch this, see what you guys think. Um, I suppose a big question that if anybody has answers to that, if you think of something, let me know is, uh, or if you think of a good like way to reason about this is uh, building the index on chain versus off chain. Uh, so as we've done in the smart contract, we built the index of the geo hashes in the smart contract, uh, which made it easier to use the EVM to look things up. Um, but uh, uh, it's expensive to maintain that data structure on chain. And so uh, if this were going to be uh, actually used and deployed and become part of ENS, uh, that would be something to look at as like, how can you not only manage the data structure the most efficient way you possibly can, but is there a way to pull it out and not require like, a whole new like set of software that manages the index off chain. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think James, you added into the uh, discussion board. So if anyone wants to have some comment or fast conversation, please uh, comment on uh, the discussion board on ENS. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is all the Q, uh, basically show and tell, but last five, 10 minutes, I just, and also reach out say like, can we do after five? Yeah, I mean, this is our session, so we, I can keep it open for another 30 minutes so you can talk about random and shit, but just wanted to, my, uh, yes. My suggestion is that we take a slightly longer break and maybe at uh, half past the next hour. We uh, anyone who wants to join the after party joins the Discord voice channel on our Discord. Yeah, that would be good. But yeah, so we can do that. Like, uh, so it's eight fifty now. So nine thirty, we can do after party <laughs> if anyone's interested. But before that, on last ten minutes, I was wondering, especially for this. So you know, these four people suggested and implemented very interesting solution leveraging ENS. And uh, I think there's lots of opportunity. People, the more people integrate with ENS, the wider adoption is. Uh, but adoption is currently slow. And I'm keen to know if there's anything we haven't covered enough, but there's some opportunity we should like, pay more attention. Does anyone have any opinion, suggestion, comment about how to make more fast more people to use ENS? And second, how to encourage or you know use developers to build more DAP which is more integrated with the uh, ENS. Does anyone have a kind of suggestion, comment or well, I have uh, an idea. Go on. So I have um, a very cool URL for, uh, from ENS is a bitcoinwallet.it. And I want this, um, this ENS to, to be very cheap for the people. So if you have any ideas or about how can we use that, I was looking at OpenSea and they are doing very cool stuff um, with Decentraland domain names, subdomain names. And well, if you have any ideas, you can send me a message. Is your question how you, so you have a specific ENS name? And yeah, you, and I think it's subdomain. fantastic for the, for the people. Huh? You, you want to issue subdomain? Uh, yeah, I want to start uh, selling subdomains in a very, very cheap way. For and I'm pretty sure, especially for Bitcoiners, they might like to have this, this, this. Yeah, this. ENS. Yes. So we do have a subdomain registrar, 
if you go it we it's kind of underdeveloped but if uh, if you go to ensnow.org something ensnow. I can't remember the URL uh, you can search subdomain so like if we, I want to have something to do with Makoto if you search then it shows like a list of available domain so like you can have like yeah a I, I have used it but I, I just thinking about which platform to use because I want to to yeah most people use it the the better so like your suggestion is maybe no. improve upon the subdomain registry I, I'm not sure if we can I, I know OpenSea is doing very good job I know you of course guys are doing a fantastic job I just uh, I'm just thinking about which platform to use where more people is can use this and use it. Yeah, I think OpenSea is more about how to transfer the ownership of the domain you own. So if I, I have my token .es, and if I want to sell this to someone else, then I put the auction to the domain. If you want to sell the subdomain of yours, I don't think uh, OpenSea... No, absolutely, you are right. And, and I was... Um, observing that but nowadays uh, Decentraland did a development and I don't know how did how 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 can they do that that they can start selling subdomains because yeah. when I try to offer a subdomain on OpenSea it's, it's not working yeah so there's a way to turn your domain a uh, subdomain as a ENS sorry non-fungible token so which I've used uh, at the couple of the presentations. So I'll include that, how to do that in uh, my workshop I mentioned, okay. So if you come to my workshop next week, I'll tell you I how will. to do that. I will, I will. <laughs> Sorry for that. No, but I'll include that, yeah. And okay, then cool. I'll just read some comment. Uh, drop BNS token to anyone that interacted with the registry uh, from host in waiting room. Uh, that was from Hadrian. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you just want Toku. I think there's a cut last week someone asked, like, why don't, don't ENS <laughs> issue tokens and this stuff? Uh, I don't know, e eel farming opportunity for the ENS token. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to speak up? Uh, uh, well, we I have another joke. I have another idea to okay, mention. go on. Mm, I think for the use of ENS, um, it's it's we need that people can use uh, can build a website in a very very easy way, like a couple of clicks. And I have been observing other companies doing very good job with that. And I think we should get the best ideas from other companies to try to get it here and for people to use it in a very easy way. I know also Almonit is working on that. And I think it's pretty cool that, um, but the, the more we can um, make easy for the people to build a very uh, a website without knowing uh, coding, I think it's going to help the, the entire industry. Yeah, I think uh, Rick created some CMS site using something integrated with ENS in the last uh, IPFS hackathon. Is, is Richard here? Rick Moon? Or Sorry, I missed that. What was that about? Did you create some CMS software using like IPFS and point it to ENS? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I made me seeks a long time ago, but the most recent hackathon, it was more of a replacement for medium. That's what you mean. Yeah. So that one, you let people to, and you store in IPFS and then you set the, you point. Yeah, so actually, that, well, that brings up, so one of the things I wanted to bring up that just dawned on me during this last talk. Um, so for Waxlet, which was that project, I didn't actually store the ENS entry on the blockchain. Um, I just emitted an event on the blockchain. So the blockchain, like the contract was responsible for checking that you owned the ENS name, but then just emitted the event. Because now it's easy to query and it can change over time and it's super cheap because you're not paying to update storage. So I actually have, during this thing, I've been kind of like muddling around on an EIP 
like, like a lot of things like text records for websites and email addresses and ENS content doesn't actually need to be stored on chain because you never have a contract that cares what the content hash is of a given Almanet website. All you really care about is that the person who owned that ENS name at some point said this is the right thing. So it might actually be a lot cheaper rather than storing this to just emit the event. So I'm kind of making an EIP now, um, which I'll get feedback on later, but for just spooling information, like I just need to be able to say like the, the name hash that's associated with some sort of identifier and then the actual content. And then it can be up to all minute to actually just use get logs to pull this information, pull the most recent thing and then, then show it. Um, so that's how we kept it cheap as well for, for Waxlet. And now I'm thinking rather than having a special Waxlet contract spooler, just have this as part of the resolver, um, like ABI. Does that make sense? I might not have explained it awesomely. I'm not sure I understood it, but is it something similar to IPNS where you can just give up, uh, like, you know, your IPNS of IP, uh, IPNS of IPFS and then if you can update it like off chain? Well, the way it works right now, so when you, I think all minute, correct me if I'm wrong, but all minute, basically you take your content hash and you call set text right or set content hash on your resolver to set it. Now this stays on chain, that's not really necessary. You could have just emitted an event that said set content hash to the content hash. And then when all is trying to display the website, it doesn't call the ENS contract and ask for the resolver and then ask for the, 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 the owner. It could just ask the contract, like ask the resolver, give me your logs and the log can contain the bytes. Does that make sense? It's still, it'll make more sense. Well, it won't make more sense. It'll make slightly less nonsense once it's EIPified. So when, when would the EIP be ready? Because I think that I'd be happy to read that. Uh, sorry? When would the EIP approximately be ready? Like, Oh, I mean, I might have it ready for looking at tonight. Um, I mean, I could just put it as a gist or whatever. Because um, I also want to discuss wildcard things. We'll do that in the after party. But yes, it's, uh, I mean, the, it was super simple. Like I, I, actually here, give me one second. I just, I can type oh, why the- I want until after party and you can discuss Yeah, exactly. Party. Sounds perfect. You have 30 minutes to write this. <laughs> yes. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, so the meeting data, love to see, we are planning to add the NS as module for devs to integrate that. That, yeah, so uh, there's one project which asked to pitch, but we, we didn't have time. But there's a one uh, project called DAP Starter by Decentology. Uh, it's like a truffle, but like a better. And they, I think he also, I've actually used it because uh, that DAP Starter supports, I think, uh, Ethereum and the uh, uh, Flow blockchain as well. And it's kind of interesting project. So uh, if you, are in, you know, looking for new tools prior to it's online, you might want to check that tool as well. And uh, I think this is it for now. So like as uh, Nick suggested uh, in 30 minutes, uh, if you wanna just, you know, tag along and talk with people, uh, just join the Discord channel of the uh, ENS, which uh, I think Nick already shared. And also there's a link from uh, ens.domain. So, I'll see you guys in 30 minutes, but thank you so much for coming out. Like it, it was great that you know, everybody joined. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, actually Makoto. Yes. How do we get to that, that thing you're talking about? I didn't see a voice channel in the, in the, the discord. Oh, really? I have to make one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I saw it comes up. You, there's a voice channel general. I think we can just I mean, use this that. This is what I see when I look at this. Like, is it one of them? Am I in the right channel or? Yeah, yeah, now you can see voice channel general underneath. So yeah, I think you can just join that. Oh, 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 okay. I was looking for the words voice channel bash general. I see, got you, I understand now. Yeah, because I think each Discord has voice channel by default. Right. So I haven't I'm, used it gonna, good enough. To... Yeah, I'm gonna take show analyst. Stuff. That's good. Thank you guys. Uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on where you are. See ya. Yeah.
Bye.